There is one character in Hotline Miami that drives the story for the entire franchise without speaking a single word. The ever silent jacket is a huge focal point of the series. The things he does creates ripples that change the very landscape of America. But he never truly understands the consequences of his actions, nor how he could have stopped everything, making his story one of confusion and tragedy. Let's take a look at Jacket's story and see the far-reaching ramifications of his actions. We first meet our silent protagonist in a strange nightmare state. He enters a room where he finds three masked individuals, a woman wearing a donkey mask, a man in a white suit wearing an owl mask, and a man that dresses like him wearing a rooster mask. The woman asks who Jacket is, but realizes Jacket himself doesn't know who he is. She then mentions it might be better that way. The man in the owl mask simply greets Jacket with hostility, saying he doesn't know who he is and tells him to leave. The woman asks if Jacket really wants to know who he is, warning that knowing oneself means acknowledging one's actions. Seemingly trying to hide the truth, she warns that Jacket's been doing terrible things lately. The man in the rooster mask cuts in, revealing he knows who Jacket is, and says they've met before. Jacket doesn't remember, so the man gives him a hint, asking Jacket if April the 3rd means anything to him. After all, that was the day of their first meeting. Jacket's mind wanders back to April 3rd, 1989. His day started off pretty normal. Then he noticed he had a message on his answering machine. The message said the cookies he ordered had been delivered. Jacket finds a box outside his door, but it doesn't contain any cookies. Instead, there's a rubber rooster mask and a note that orders Jacket to get a briefcase. Ominously, the note says failure isn't an option and that they will be watching. Jacket makes his way to the metro where he finds a man holding a briefcase, but he's guarded by several men in white suits, and as soon as they see Jacket, they try and attack him. Jacket fights off his attackers, killing them, and somehow finds it a satisfying feeling. He retrieves the briefcase and completes his assignment, throwing the briefcase in a dumpster. Then a homeless man appears, angry that someone is in his alley. Jacket fights off the homeless man, killing him by smashing his head into the pavement. However, unlike his last murders, Jacket feels sick and throws up on the pavement. He quickly jumps in his car and leaves the scene. Before heading home, he stops by a local convenience store and the clerk at the desk, nicknamed Beard, greets Jacket like an old friend. After an uncomfortable conversation about a recent breakup, Beard tells Jacket to grab anything he'd like, saying it's on the house. Jacket, comforted by his friend, grabs a snack and leaves where he hopes to forget the terror of the night. However, this was not a one-off event. A few days later, after reading a newsletter about the patriotic organization he joined, Jacket finds a new message on his answering machine, and thus a cycle of violence and gore is started. Every few days, Jacket receives another message directing him to an address where he's tasked with killing the people inside. The local paper has taken notice of the killings, and Jacket begins cutting out articles that pertain to his crimes. He also frequently visits his friend Beard, who actually has multiple jobs. He also works at a pizza place, a video rental store, and a local bar, and always has something different to say. One night at the video rental store, Beard mentions a massacre that happened the other night, saying someone in a rubber mask was responsible. He feels there was no loss though, since he heard it was a bunch of Ruskies that were killed, a feeling Jacket finds he agrees with. Jacket continues with his violent missions until one night during one of his missions, he comes across a woman lying on a bed. With tears streaking down her face, she tells Jacket to get it over with and finish her. Jacket stands over her, but instead of killing her, he picks her up and carries her to his car, where he returns her to his apartment. That night, Jacket has another nightmare with the people in the masks. The woman notes that Jacket has been busy, and the man in the rooster mask realizes that Jacket remembers him now, but still doesn't know who he is or who introduced them. He's cut off by the man in the owl mask who again berates Jacket saying he's not a nice person. The woman cuts in, saying a picture is starting to take form, but some of the pieces don't fit. Maybe because she doesn't like him that way. 
The man in the rooster mask announces their time is up, but gives four questions for Jacket to mull over. 1. Do you like hurting other people? 2. Who is leaving the messages on your answering machine? 3. Where are you right now? And 4. Why are we having this conversation? Jacket awakes from his nightmare to find himself back in his apartment. But he's not alone anymore. The girl he rescued is lying on the couch. And over the next few days, she doesn't leave the apartment. Jacket still receives phone messages, but the missions have become a little strange. One of his missions tasks him with attacking people staying in a hotel, but the men in white suits seem to be meeting and guarding men in black suits. Jacket kills all of them, and when he checks the papers a few days later, it turns out the men in black were politicians for the Russo-American coalition, and the men in white had connections to a criminal network. He remembers another article that mentioned victims of his attack were members of the Russian Mafia. And Jacket wonders if there's a connection between the Mafia and the politicians. But his thoughts are interrupted by another message on his phone. He completes his most recent mission, then a phone at the location rings. It's the callers, and they task him with going to the phone company to deal with a prank caller. Jacket heads to the phone company to find a man in a biker helmet using the computer. When Jacket enters, the man instantly turns and attacks him, and a vicious fight between the two breaks out. Eventually, Jacket emerges from the fight and makes his way back to his apartment. Jacket still meets with Beard, but now his conversations with him are different. Whereas before, Beard simply greeted his friend with kindness, he now comments on recent events, particularly the killings. At the movie store, he mentions that the police think there are multiple people wearing masks going around and killing Russians. Jacket then recalls finding people during his attacks that wore rubber masks, just like he does. These developments trouble Jacket, and he tries to shake off the feelings, but Beard notices Jacket's unhappiness when he visits him at the bar. He mentions he doesn't feel good either, saying it's a feeling he hasn't had since San Francisco. Jacket feels like he vaguely remembers something about San Francisco too, but can't remember all of it. He takes a drink Beard prepared for him and heads home to try and forget his troubles. However, he again has a nightmare with the masked people. The woman on the left seems concerned that Jacket looks ill and suggests he sees a doctor. The man in the owl mask cuts in, angry that Jacket has come back, and says that if Jacket insists on coming back, he'll be the one that leaves. The man in the rooster mask then asks if Jacket has been thinking about the questions he asked him last time. He tells Jacket he isn't here to give him answers, as questions are the only thing he has to offer a man like him. The woman cuts in again, saying Jacket should rest, as carrying too much weight inevitably leads to the collapse of everything. The man in the rooster mask says the next time they meet will be the last, and offers three predictions before their final meeting. 1. Someone you know is not who you think he is. 2. Something will soon be taken from you. And three, on July the 21st, you will wake up in a bigger house. Jacket again awakes in his apartment. Over the past few weeks, the girl has been living with Jacket, and now her effects begin to be felt. The apartment is much cleaner. All the pizza boxes and newspaper clippings are gone, and she's now staying in the bedroom with Jacket, although in a separate bed. However, the beds soon come together, implying a deeper meaning to their relationship. However, all is not well with our silent hero. Jacket still receives his phone messages, and the missions he's sent on become more and more dangerous. During one mission, the police begin a raid on the location he was attacking, and Jacket narrowly escapes. And during another, the gangsters set up an ambush in an attempt to kill him, but Jacket manages to escape the encounter with his life. These escalations are stressing him out, and disturbingly, he begins to see the corpses of those he's killed. Even worse, they talk to him. He tries to meet with his friend Beard to clear his head, but even he's acting strange. He went to visit him at the convenience store one day, and when he entered, he saw the body of the man he fought at the phone home headquarters. Jacket stepped over the body and talked to Beard, who says he has something important to tell Jacket. He tells him that this, all of this, isn't really happening, and to demonstrate, he makes the man's corpse disappear under a flash of static. Beard then greets Jacket like he's always done, as if nothing happened. 
uneasily, Jacket leaves, and now Beard is nowhere to be seen. Whenever Jackie goes to visit him, he's instead greeted by an unwelcoming bald man who quickly dismisses him. Confused by the disappearance of his friend, Jacket never stays around for long. Then one night, Jacket returns home to his apartment to find the door open. In the bathroom across from the front door, he finds girlfriend shot to death on the bathroom floor. Devastated, Jacket storms into the living room to find a man in a rat mask sitting on his couch. After a short conversation, Jacket is shot by the man in the mask. <laughs> he awakes in another nightmare sequence, but this time he's in his apartment. He wanders to the living room where he finds the man in the rooster mask sitting on his couch. The man warns Jacket that things won't end well for him, and he's going to end up all alone. He lets Jacket in on a secret, saying anything he does from now on will be pointless, that he'll never understand what's happened to him or why, and it's all his own fault. He offers no more answers, but tells Jacket to head for a warm bed across the hall. Jacket makes his way across the hall while Static changes his clothes into a hospital gown. He enters the room to find the bed is a hospital bed and find himself lying in it, and he finally remembers all that's happened to him. The attack by the rat-masked assassin put him in a coma, and everything he's been experiencing has been a combination of memories and coma dreams. The phone messages, the girl, the attack by the rat-masked man, all of these were real memories, but the conversations with the masked people in his dreams were parts of his mind battling to make him realize he's dreaming and wake him up to return him to the real world. Jacket recalls the predictions made by the man in the rooster mask from their last meeting, and he realizes all of his predictions have come true. His first prediction, someone you know is not who you think he is, was in reference to his friend Beard. Jacket's meetings with his friend Beard never happened because Beard has been dead for a number of years. He remembers way back in 1985, the two served in the military together during an armed conflict named the Russo-American War, where they developed a close friendship. During their last mission, Jacket was gravely injured in an explosion, but Beard carried him to safety and managed to save his life. Jacket was incredibly thankful to his friend, but Beard told him there was no need to thank him, saying, it's on the house. So that Jackie could always remember who saved him, Beard gave him a picture of the two taken months ago by a rider. Clutching the memento in his hands, Jacket managed to survive his injuries. Shortly after, he and Beard were discharged from the military and returned home, Beard to San Francisco and Jacket to Miami, but maintained their friendship with frequent phone calls. However, on April 3rd, 1986, three years to the day of Jacket's first phone message, Beard was killed when a nuclear bomb was dropped in the city of San Francisco by the Soviet Union. Before he died, he and Jacket were talking on the phone, and Beard asked if Jacket had ever gotten around to sending him a copy of the photo. Jacket never did. After Beard's death, Jacket felt immense grief and guilt over letting his friend down, feelings he carried for several years. He never fully came to terms with his friend's death, and when he fell into his coma, he hallucinated his friend working at the numerous storefronts. He realizes that when the phone calls began coming in and he found they targeted Russians, he went along with them because he felt he was getting revenge for his fallen friend. And that granted him some form of closure. However, he didn't expect something else to emerge during his vendetta to help him move past Beard's death. The woman has had a profound effect on him, and their relationship has deepened maybe even to the point of love. With her, Jacket felt he may be able to move past the death of his friend and live in happiness. But with her death, that has now been taken from him, fulfilling the rooster masked man's second prediction. And finally, on July 21st, 1989, Jacket awakes from his coma, confirming the last prediction of the man in the rooster mask. He overhears a police officer ask a doctor when Jacket will wake up mentioning they arrested the man that attacked Jacket and have him locked up at the police station, 
but he isn't saying anything. Jacket drifts back to sleep, but resolves to find the man that killed girlfriend in order to get revenge for her death. When Jacket awakes again, he rises from his bed and ducks the surging eyes of the officers and doctors escaping from the hospital. He hazily stumbles back to his apartment building where he finds his car has been destroyed by vandals. He makes his way back to his apartment to find it still have crime scene tape across the door. Tearing through the tape and entering the apartment reveals it's been totally ruined. Garbage lays strewn about the place and furniture is missing, likely stolen. In the bathroom, the police outline of a body is still on the floor. Jacket grabs his clothes from the laundry hamper and sets out to the police station to confront the man in the rat mask. Jacket fights his way through dozens of officers to find the man locked in a jail cell. He opens the door and the man is amazed to see Jacket. He expresses remorse for killing girlfriend and says he doesn't have any answers for it. But Jacket feels the man is hiding something and attacks him. Bloodied, the man says he and Jacket may not be all that different and asks Jacket if he's also been receiving strange phone messages. Shocked, Jacket realizes the man was also manipulated by the caller being sent to attack him after receiving a phone message. The man suggests checking the police files to see if they have more information. He wants to ask Jacket to spare his life, but knows Jacket is here for revenge. Jacket stands over him and begins strangling him. However, perhaps feeling a bond with the man over being manipulated by the callers, or perhaps feeling killing girlfriend's reluctant killer won't get him catharsis, Jacket releases the man choosing to spare him. He finds the police file about the calls and leaves the station. That night, he studies the case file, which reveals the calls have been traced to a club with ties to the Russian Mafia. This leads Jacket to believe the Russian Mafia were the ones that were making the calls, and in particular, made the call to Richter to attack him and kill girlfriend. Jacket also remembers that Russians were the ones responsible for the death of Beard in 1986. To get revenge for the death of his loved ones, Jacket decides to destroy what remains of the Russian Mafia. Jacket makes his way to the club and decimates those inside. He finds the manager on the top floor in his office who tries to bribe Jacket, but when it becomes obvious Jacket's not interested in money, he quickly gives up the location of his boss, the leader of the Russian Mafia. He begs for his life, but Jacket isn't in the mood for mercy and gruesomely beats the man to death with his bare hands. Jacket then makes his way to the address given to him by the manager to find it's a lavish villa. On the top floor waits the boss of the Russian Mafia. Before confronting the Russian leader, Jacket fights off and kills two Pink Panthers and the bodyguard of the leader. The leader begins firing upon Jacket but Jacket manages to fatally injure the leader by using knives dropped by his bodyguard. The leader realizes he's going to die at the hands of Jacket, but denies him the satisfaction of revenge by taking his own life. The phone on the desk rings, cutting through the silence of the room. Jacket answers and realizes there's one person left to kill. He picks up a gun and takes the elevator upstairs where he finds an old man in a wheelchair. At first, the man wants to know what Jacket is doing there, but seeing the gun in his hands, realizes why he's there. Knowing his time is up, he reflects on the terrible things he's done in his life before echoing the parting words of the man in the rooster mask. Nothing seems to really matter anymore, does it? Jacket then levels a gun at his head and fires killing the patriarch of the Russian Mafia. He walks out to the balcony, throws his mask away, and lights a cigarette. Believing his revenge to be complete, he pulls something from his pocket. It's a photo of him and Beard from 1985. He looks upon the memento one final time before tossing it from the balcony to fly off into the neon void. Shortly afterwards, Jacket is arrested by the police. He's imprisoned for his crimes and waits for his trial. One day, while talking to his lawyer, the prison he's staying in experiences a massive riot. Many prisoners and guards are killed in the chaos, and one prisoner even managed to escape. However, Jacket didn't fight, nor tried to escape, indicating he has given up his fight, believing it to be over. 
However, his actions in the summer of 1989 have far-reaching effects. Upset with the changes to America following the Russo-American War, there's a portion of the population that sympathizes with Jacket Slaughter and protests his trial. One group of sympathizers even take it a step further and try to achieve infamy of their own by replicating Jacket's crimes. The infamy of Jacket's story also permeates into Hollywood, and a horror movie based on his actions is created. This movie has received criticism by some for its glorification of violence. The criminal empire of the Russian Mafia crumbles, and gang wars erupt in its absence. Eventually, the Colombian cartel filled the void left by the Russians, but there are rumblings that the Russians intend to reclaim their lost territory. When scrutinizing Jacket's defense during his trial, a local writer notices there are some inconsistencies with his story, and he determines to find the truth behind it, which leads to him learning the story of another mass murderer. But most important, the news that part of the Russo-American coalition was corrupt and worked with the Russian Mafia has led to the dissolution of Russo-American relations. And during a conference in December of 1991, the presidents of America and Russia are assassinated by a group of patriots in a bloody coup of the government of America. This eventually leads to the destruction of Miami and seemingly the rest of America in a nuclear war between itself and Russia. In these final moments, Jacket is in his prison cell. Constantly surrounded by death, his life was one filled with immense grief. The phone calls eventually allowed him to pursue a hate-fueled revenge, and although he thinks his fight is over, he never finds out the true source of the calls, and thus never gains true catharsis. Instead, he wallows in his grief alone. Just how Richard said he'd end up. Maybe if he chose to walk a different path, things could have turned out different, and Jacket could have achieved true happiness. The bright flash of an explosion washes over the screen, closing the book on Jacket's story. Jacket's tale is a prime example of the saying, actions speak louder than words. Without speaking a single word, Jacket manages to drive the entire story of the Hotline Miami series, making him the most important character of the entire franchise.